uses another word to describe himself. Uh, if, if you ask him, he'll say Woody Allen. <laughs> I tend to think Larry David, but he says Woody Allen. <laughs> and I can see the I can see the Brooklyn connection. Uh, and then I, I sort of looked up some famous Woody Allen quotes, and I wanted to see is this really what David is all about? And so you can you can make that judgment. I've got a few here. Woody Allen once said, these are all authentic, famous Woody Allen quotes. You probably know them. And uh, David might have said this thing as well. I've never been an intellectual, but I have this look. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Woody Allen once said, and David would likely agree with his teaching and music performance and innovation, if you're not failing every now and again, it's a sign you're not doing anything very innovative. <laughs> And Woody Allen once said, and, and David may have felt this way when he played sports, when we played softball, I'd steal second base, feel guilty, and go back. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually heard David say something like this at dinner. It's a Woody Allen quote. The food here is terrible, and the portions are too small. <laughs> and Regarding, I don't know how Edna would respond to this, uh, uh, but uh, Woody Allen once said, in my house, I'm the boss, my wife is just the decision maker. <laughs> and I, I, I'm not sure if David would agree with this, this wisdom that might be related to public health. You can live to be 100 if you give up all the things that make you want to live to 100. <laughs> but I think Woody Allen would, this, this quote really does sound like David, the talent for being happy is appreciating and liking what you have instead of what you don't have. So David has an awful lot. He's a virtuosi, and we appreciate him for sharing all of those qualities with us over the many years. Thank you. where David was looking, and so he said to us, just follow my nose. Wherever my nose is, that's where I'm looking, and that's the person I want to call on. So we decided that we wanted to hear from multiple students who he has taught over the years and ask them what they remember about David. So really, how do you measure this life? Maybe if I can advance. So we could be very specific in epidemiology. We could do dates, counts, and person years. We'll do that for a moment. So our follow-up starts in 1993 here at Emory. We certainly had UNC follow-up before then. And you'll notice I'm trying to do this in Carolina blue for you. Um, we have 24 person years of follow-up with no loss to follow up with David. We have two deans, three chairs, and one interim chair during his time here. 24 qualifying exams as best I can tell that he has either contributed to or been in charge of. Two primary classes that he's taught consistently for a total of 49 times just here at Emory. And those are his consistent courses, not his other side courses that he teaches. And that's approximately 1,450 lectures that I can guarantee he's given here at Emory. And what we have are 365 days worth of lectures. <laughs> So then we decided to actually, with Jenna's help, talk to our students who graduated and get their thoughts. So if you had to give us one word about David, what would it be? And here's our word cloud. So, <laughs> shirts, thank goodness you wear them. 
Shirts are number one by a magnitude of about fivefold, um, but jazz and teacher are second. But there's some really great ones on here. Edna makes it on here. Um, badass makes it on here. <laughs> Modeling, survival, logistic regression, things you would expect to see, but passion and caring and kindness and humor make it on here, which really you don't always get for all of your teachers. So we then also asked for specific stories and quotes. So everything I'm about to give you is an actual quote. They're representative an unbiased representation of all the quotes that we receive from our students, and they're in certain categories. So let's talk for a moment about your classes. So your enthusiasm for teaching is unmatched. You demystify complicated subjects. Your favorite answer is, it depends. <laughs> and I use this all the time, and I actually didn't even remember I'd gotten it from you. So thank you for that. Um, you once asked for a spaghetti recipe for five points on a midterm. Remember that? It wasn't my midterm. I didn't get five points for that. And it was free? Yeah. And then um, he was called the god of epidemiology by one particular student. Now let's talk about your textbooks, um, of which there are many. Survival analysis is probably my favorite. Um, when I was in this class for him, it actually wasn't bound yet. You gave us a set of proofs and asked us if we had anything we wanted to add to this textbook, which was pretty amazing. And this is probably my favorite quote we got for you. Even though you're retiring, you will continue to teach every time someone opens one of your textbooks. How cool is that? <laughs> Let's talk for a moment about your students. Eli is here. Always found a way to connect with every student on a personal level. Here's a specific one we both hated to do. <laughs> so I think you have that in common with multiple students. <laughs> Dr. K learned his students' names, as you've heard a couple times already tonight, and that's no small feat when you have 150 students in a course. Always one of my biggest supporters. Although Rollins has many great professors, Dr. K is the only one who could make an Epi Methods course that interesting. I think we all agree with that. Let's talk for a moment about your shirts. These are direct quotes, please remember. Awesomely terrible shirts. Next, probably my favorite about this. A trailblazer for teachers who long to lecture in Hawaiian shirts. When, when I see a Hawaiian shirt, I think of Dr. K and I smile. My most vivid memory of Emory is being taken on a tour of his crazy shirt closet. And then I apparently missed this shirt, but a lot of people spoke about your silver disco ball shirt. So lots of comments about that. I need to come see it. Yeah. Oh, they will. Oh, okay. Coming up soon. And then from uh, Brian Maddox, we have this quote. Now you can spend your time on a tropical island. You already have the wardrobe. <laughs> and weddings were a regular comment and theme in these um, comments and pictures that we asked for. So here we have Allie Curry. Um, getting married right before her qualifying exam with her Dr. Kleinbaum textbook study. And then you officiated several student weddings. So here's Samantha Rose's wedding in um, 2000. So he both officiated and played jazz flute at her reception. And in your own words, um, the thing that makes it exciting about teaching is that it's not easy to do. As a teacher who has been teaching for 45 years, this is a slightly older quote, um, one of the things I'm really good at is adapting to my audience, and I can attest that he certainly is that. When I'm teaching and I become able to tailor my presentation to the style of the circumstances, I'm an improviser, I think also in your music, and I get in there and I feel the audience out. And I think that's one of the things that those of us who now teach, having taken courses from David, have certainly learned that if you're not connected with that audience, you are not giving them what you should in each course. To continue in your own words, the best reward for teaching is communicating with people and teaching them how to do a good job. So he said that in a story I found about him. So here are a couple specific quotes written to you. You were a joy to learn from, a wonderful and patient mentor. Not a lot of lecturers get to be called a mentor, so that's pretty special. Your passion for teaching showed in everything you did. You imparted a love and methodology on your students that cannot be beat. You should be very proud of the legacy you have created. 
your contributions to public health are immeasurable, and your influence on our careers, all of us collectively, cannot be overestimated. So a couple specific thank yous that were themes throughout our representative sample. Your students thank you, and they love you. Specifically, thank you for your service to us, the students. I know you've served the department, the school, the community, but really look at your students in this room. Thank you for always having an open door for us. He's one of those legends, but you could actually go in and talk to him, and that's pretty remarkable. Thank you for serving as an inspiration for budding epidemiologists, and thank you for being the professor who ignited our passion for research methodology. So I leave you with your work class. and I'm over at CDC and uh, uh, I have a lot of memories of David. Uh, I'll start with a, a memory before I actually started talking with David though and that was when I was a graduate student at Emory and I had Dr. Brogan and Dr. Kuttner and, and all the great teachers over here uh, in the biostatistics department and uh, it came time for me to take a job and uh, one of the opportunities I had was to join CDC. And I was, uh, people were talking to me about joining CDC, and they said, well, you know, David, uh, it, it's not like uh, biostatistics and epidemiology are what CDC is really known for. And so I, did, I took the job anyway, and I said that one of the things that I'd like to do is try to somehow make it such that when people think of CDC, they think of the highest quality epidemiology and biostatistics that, that, that you can get, particularly in a federal agency. So... Uh, Back in the early 1990s when Ray Greenberg had first come here and uh, David and I had struck up several conversations over the years and he was in Australia at the time. Uh, Dr. Boring was a key figure in this, uh, in this little story as well and this goes back to what Dean Curran said a few minutes ago. And that was, uh, I struck up a conversation with Dr. Greenberg and said, you know, CDC really, really needs quality epidemiologists, biost biostatisticians, and sometimes it's hard to recruit. What do you think if we talk about a joint effort? And Dr. Greenberg was very interested in that. Dr. Boring was very interested in that. And so CDC uh, was able to, to help provide some of the uh, uh, initiatives to get Dr. Kleinbaum to move down from, uh, from uh, Chapel Hill to Atlanta. And, and, and I must tell you, it was an easy sell at CDC because the uh, powers that be there, all of the leadership, they already knew who Dr. Kleinbaum was. And so to get, to get them to agree to help get David here was a real easy task. And uh, I must tell you that the hundreds of people that Dr. Kleinbaum taught at CDC in very large as well as small um, uh, forums, uh, have all benefited from having him here in Atlanta and at, at, at Emory. Uh, David and I were fortunate enough to start the analytic methods forum at CDC back in the 93-94 and David was of course the featured speaker there. Every, every month we would have a lecture and David was the speaker, uh, featured speaker. I would always introduce him and we had a, a, a running, um, running gag and that was uh, with his garish shirts he would get up and he would he would get in front of the microphone and I'd be somewhere in the audience and, I, and I'd, I'd, David would look at me and he said, is this loud enough? And I'd say, what, the shirt or the microphone? <laughs> every, every month we said that, we did that, every single month. And uh, it got to be a standing joke and so people of course, uh, uh, they'd ask me where my Gary shirt is and uh, I told them I'd lend, lend them to David. At any rate though, David, everybody has said everything possibly 
that they could, and I certainly can't top anything that they've that they said about you. I will say something I think is a little bit different that maybe I haven't heard, maybe I missed it, and that is when you go back to talk about the the books and the active epi, we're not talking about books that you find everywhere else. We're talking about a special type of book in the survival, uh, your survival book, where he provides a, a, a kind of a, a, a narrative on the side so that it helps the students. This is an entirely different concept that David came up with, or at least I thought it was, and that has been extremely effective teaching tool. Everybody has to climb on Cooper Morgan Stern book, but, but, but to go back to his newer books where he has these narratives and, and active epi. I remember when we talked about that, when you had an idea, let me, I'd like to do something that's different, uh, a software that's different. So we're not talking about just a fantastic teacher. We are talking about an innovator and somebody who has touched people, and, and students in, in innumerable ways and with very innovative books with an innovative software, with an innovative way of reaching students, of making them feel important, and never thinking that they ask a stupid question. David, you're the best. Uh, I love you, and you're a great friend. Uh, well, hello, I'm Sherman James. And um, I took some time off on my, my extended honeymoon in Arkansas <laughs> to come in and pay, uh, pay tribute to uh, a very, very, very dear friend, David Kleinbaum. So I think I might be the person in the room who has known David for the longest. I think I might be, at least in this particular gathering. David and I met in the early winter of 1973, when I was in the process of completing my dissertation, and was under consideration for a position in epidemiology at UNC Chapel Hill, a job that I, I did take, and I stayed at UNC for 16 years. But um, I didn't know anything about epidemiology because I was not formally trained in epidemiology. And I had the most boring conversations imagine, <laughs> with people who were sort of in the light and the basic sciences. Very important disciplines I subsequently learned to appreciate. But it was my hallway conversation with David when I was there that, and we started talking about the Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> now I grew up in the South in the 1950s and I was a huge Brooklyn Dodgers fan. And David was a huge Brooklyn Dodgers fan. I was a huge Jackie Robinson fan. David is a huge Jackie Robinson fan. So we made this connection around the Brooklyn Dodgers. And when I left Chapel Hill, I thought to myself, that's somebody that I would really like to see again. I probably won't, but it would be nice to see him again. Well, I did go to Chapel Hill, and David became my first really good friend, my best friend in Chapel Hill. And we have been really good friends for 43 years. And my very first publication in epidemiology was with David Kleinbaum. I learned so much from David about epidemiologic methods. He was, he was a, he's obviously a great teacher, all the testimonies about that are certainly true, but he was also a great teacher for colleagues like me who needed to learn this new discipline called epidemiology. And he's also quite a good athlete, by the way. I'm, I'm not sure about now, but he used to, he used, we used to play one-on-one -on -one basketball, and he would wipe the floor with me with basketball. I don't mind, I don't mind admitting that publicly. And, um, and, and, and during my brief, my brief time at Emory, I was here for a couple of years, David and I would go out to Graves games, Hawks games. He was a good friend here. He made life in Atlanta really wonderful for me. And so I just have so much appreciation for David. He's been, he's been a wonderful friend, a wonderful mentor, and as people have said, just a, a really good person. You know, it's one thing to be a great scholar, a great researcher, a great teacher, but also to, to be a good human being is something really, really special. 
And David is a really, really good person. Congratulations, David. I'm Victor Schoenbeck from UNC also, so I thought I'd follow Sherman, who's been one of my mentors. Uh, I first arrived at uh, the Department of Epidemiology at UNC in 1977, fall of 77, and met David Kleinbaum then. Uh, <coughs> I had taken introductory biostatistics, so I wasn't going to be taking his course, uh, but he very kindly offered to let me have the midterm exam just to look over and see what I thought, and then he scored it for me. Uh, and after that, I realized that I needed to do some learning of biostatistics, and he very kindly lent me his course notes and everything, and so I, I did a self-study uh, catching up on biostatistics. But I then took his uh, uh, regression analysis course in the spring, uh, and his advanced epidemiologic methods course, where this famous textbook of uh, advanced epidemiologic methods was coming out serially each, uh, each, class, uh, each week we have a new chapter to work with as a draft. Um, and uh, it was where I learned epidemiology. Um, he then kindly invited me to be a teaching assistant the next year, and so for the next two years I was a teaching assistant and became known as a methods expert in the department on the strength of being a teaching assistant in Epi 268. I think that was the total benefit for it. Um, after that, uh, I became a faculty member in the Department of Epidemiology, and David was on my first NIH grant, and thanks to him I learned survivor, ana survivor analysis, ship analysis, uh, through the grant and uh, published a paper from the Evans County study that David had worked on when he first came to the Department of Epidemiology uh, as a biostatistic professor but working with epidemiology. David has been a teaching role model for me. Uh, I so admire his